It's good. Well, it's good to be here uh, this evening with you folks. Uh, friends in fellowship with Union Baptist Church, we enjoy your fellowship. And I trust that you've enjoyed our fellowship through the years. Uh, received a text from your pastor uh, just as we pulled up here this evening, praying for you as you preached as you preach to the folks at Grace tonight, thank you for filling in for me tonight. Well, I don't know if I'm filling in for him tonight, but I'm doing something, okay? I'm doing something here. Uh, and then I text him back, thanks, and thanks, and thanks for trusting me to preach. And uh, I, I don't think, uh, to be truthful, I think it is an, an issue of trust, I think I'll put it in this here because I know I'll forget it. Uh, I think it is an issue of trust uh, because if I remember correctly, uh, your pastor has never heard me preach before. And so this is an issue of trust. And uh, so I appreciate the opportunity uh, to do so. Uh, before, I, before I begin here tonight, uh, this, uh, in our morning service today at church, uh, we always conclude our service, uh, or at least our time together. We ask for birthdays, and we ask for anniversaries, and then if someone has a birthday or anniversary, we sing to them. And then this morning, after we did that, uh, Mary Lou wanted to address the church concerning a matter that uh, she wanted to share with the church family. And uh, I think she surprised everybody there uh, because Mary Lou and George are moving away. Uh, they're moving down to Elkhart, no, Elkins, West Virginia, uh, where their daughter Stephanie lives. And uh, it was uh, now... Now, Mary prepared me. She shared with me Wednesday that they were doing this, but uh, I was still surprised because uh, she had shared with me earlier that they were looking at next year around June. And then when she comes back from West Virginia and says that they are planning to be moved on uh, Labor Day weekend, uh, that, was, uh, that was quite a surprise. And it was quite a surprise to our church family. And uh, perhaps many of you who know Mary might be a surprise to you. Uh, I, after she shared with the church family, uh, I got up and talked a little bit. And uh, it was just a little bit, right, Mary? Just, I just talked a little bit. But one of the things that I said, it was like she stabbed me in the heart. Uh, I've been at Union Baptist Church for 20 years, and so I've known Mary for 20, 20 years. And she's one of uh, our friends. Uh, and, and when I say ours, Diana, Diana, did you get that? <laughs> Diana and my wife and Joanne, she's been uh, one of our best friends there at Union Baptist Church. And uh, we're going to miss her. And uh, she, she's also uh, was very active in our church. And so uh, I just, we were, we were listening to things that she was involved in and, and did. And it's, it's just, uh, there's five or six different things that we're going to have to uh, find people to take her place. And uh, we're not, a, we're a small church. And so it's going to be hard to find people to fill her shoes. Uh, but nonetheless, as she was talking, uh, I, I told the folks, I said, did you hear Mary talking? Did you notice how many times she said you all? She, she's, get, she's practicing getting, getting, getting ready to fit in with them all down there in West, West Virginia. And so you all, you all, you all. But... Uh, uh, that was uh, 
Uh, that was a, a surprise to our church family, and, and uh, you know, I've been pastor now for about 38 years, and every once in a while, uh, you have folks leave your church. Uh, that's difficult to say goodbye to. And so uh, she did say, that West Virginia is one of my favorite states. Uh, I love West Virginia. I spent four years of my life down in West Virginia. And uh, so she knows how much I love West Virginia. The area that they are moving to, I love that area. And uh, she, did, she did say, in spite of all of our teasing through the years about various things, uh, she did say that any time we're down that way, that, that we'd be welcome to stop by and visit and even stay if we want to. Now, George didn't say that, but Mary said that. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see how that works. Uh, but anyhow, it's good to be here with you tonight. And uh, I, I, just want, I just want to... Before we look into the scriptures, I just, I just want to uh, say how much I love your pastor and your pastor's family. Uh, you have a, uh, as a pastor, you have a gem as a pastor. And uh, I, I hope you know that. And I hope you appreciate that. And I hope that you never tire of that. And when I say a gem of a pastor, I mean a gem of a pastor. Uh, pastor Bramlett, uh, he, God has gifted him in a way that he hasn't gifted a lot of men in the ministry, myself included. And uh, since I have known him, uh, I think I've become friends with the family, except for maybe Albert down here. Uh, I think I've become friends with the family, but I have become friends with uh, Pastor Bramlett. And let me tell you something. He teaches me things that I've, I've never known from the scriptures. And I've been at this for 38 years. Uh, I became a Christian when uh, the Lord saved me when I was 18 years old, or 19 years old. And I went away to Bible college for seven years. And uh, there's things that I hear from Nathan, and I, uh, Pastor Bramlett, sorry, things that I hear from Pastor Bramlett uh, that, I, uh, that I'll call him on the phone, or when I see him, I said, I said, what in the world are you talking about? You're, you're using terminology that I've never even have heard of. You're using term theological terminology that I didn't even know existed. But I'm thankful for that. I really am. I'm thankful for that. I come to the, the monthly Bible study, and uh, I, I take notes, and, and I tell him, I said, one of these times I'm going to be teaching this. And uh, he's okay with that. So, so I, just, I, just, uh, I just want to let you know how much I appreciate your pastor, and I trust that you appreciate him uh, for uh, he's a gem. He really is a gem. Uh, Gem of a pastor, a gem of a man, a gem of a husband, a gem of a father, and a gem of a friend. And so, Nathan, did you hear me say this? <laughs> <laughs> if you would, take your Bibles. I don't know how much time I have here. I know I don't have the freedom and the liberty uh, that I have at my own church over there at Union Baptist. So I'll try, to, I'll try to be attentive to the clock here. I have it right here so I can see it. And, uh, and we'll see how far we get, okay? We'll just see how far we get. But if you would, turn, to, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 14. I'm not going to use this as my uh, uh, use this whole passage as I preach here tonight. I'm not going to share with you an expository message. I 
I'm not too sure what kind of message it's going to be, but it's not going to be an expository message. I don't, I don't know if it's a topical message or, or whatever, but it's a message that the Lord has laid on my heart in recent months. And I have been spending time with this, even with the folks at Union Baptist Church. We sang the song, someone picked the song out in your songbook, number 732, Things Are Different Now. But my burden is that we have so many people in our churches that have made professions of faith, but things are not different now. Things are not different now. Things are not different now any more than they were before. It's the same old, same old, same old lifestyle. And uh, anyone can make a profession of faith, but that doesn't make their confession of faith a real thing. And so, uh, and so, uh, I'd just like to start with John chapter 14 and go from there. <coughs> John chapter 14, the first... <coughs> The first uh, six verses are very familiar to us. Much of what I'm going to say tonight will not be new to most of you, if any of you. Uh, but, but by way of remembrance, you remember Peter wrote the saints, and I believe in Second or First Peter, that I write these things that you might remember. In other words, he had al- he had already written them things. But now he's writing them again so that they might remember the things that he had previously written to them. And so what I'm going to share with you tonight, I'm sure that most of you know much of what I'm going to share. But by way of remembrance, we need to hear these things. And we need to know these things. And we need to believe these things. And we need to live these things. The Lord Jesus himself said, uh, I'm paraphrasing it because I can't quite remember exactly how it goes, but he, he said, these people honor me with their lips and with their mouth, but their hearts are far from me. And I think that as I've been pastoring for 38 years, and Union Baptist Church is my third church that I have pastored. But I, have, but I have many pastor friends who pastor all these, all, all these different churches. And it's a concern in these days as we talk and discuss how our churches are doing. One of the big concerns, and I've even been reading about these things a lot in, in recent days as well. One of the concerns is where are our people in relationship to the God and to the Savior that they profess to know and to believe and to trust in. And so in John chapter 14, I'll just read down. <clears throat> I've been talking a lot today, and so my voice is getting kind of, kind of weak, weakened. Uh, and so you have to bear with me. <clears throat> Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Jesus isn't a liar, right? God cannot lie. Jesus is God. Uh, And so God cannot lie. So what Jesus says is truth. It's truth. So in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, that's a very familiar verse, isn't it, to us? Very familiar. 
This is one of the greatest verses in the Bible. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's, a, that's one of the greatest and most well-known verses in all the scripture, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you. Did you taste it first? Okay, thank you. Just in case you drop over dead, I'll know not to take a sip. Keep an eye on him, LaRue. So, going back to verses 5 and 6, Thomas saith unto him, <coughs> Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And for, em for emphasis, listen to, to what I say here. Jesus saith unto him, I am the one and only way. Emphasis, one and only way. The one and only truth. And the one and only life. No man cometh unto the Father, God who is in heaven, but by me alone. There's no other way. We get that, right? We get that. But do we get it? Do our lives match up with what we say we get? I have in my notes here, I read this somewhere. God says what he means, and he means what he says. Take his word for it. I was going to say take it to the bank, but you can't even trust the banks nowadays. But take his word for it. God says what he means, and he means what he says. And there's too many of us who don't live like we take God at his word, what he says, what he means, and he means what he says. I've been spending a little bit of time in Sunday school focusing on the fear of God. And the fear of God, I, I got this from, from someone else, but I, I like it. It's a simple definition. But he defines the fear of God, simply defined is to take him seriously, to take God seriously. God's fear is inseparably joined to faith. The fear of God. The, the fear of God then is to hate what God hates and love what God hates and, and love what God loves. Simply stated, simply put. Now I'm sure there are longer and deeper definitions of what the fear of God is, but this should at least get us started. And so this brings me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And before <clears throat> we take a quick skip through these verses in Matthew chapter 7, I, uh, I have worked in the funeral business for, for many, many years of my life before coming up to Union Baptist Church as the pastor. And even in recent years, last couple of years, I have also been helping out at two funeral homes, one down in Freeport and one over in Daytona Heights. And I have, I have, through the years, I have observed a lot of funeral services, as well as, I suppose, you have, too. And I also have been asked to, to uh, do many funeral services through the years. And even the funeral homes I'm helping out now, they have asked me on occasion, when a family doesn't have a, have a uh, pastor, if I would be willing to do the funeral service, and, and so I obliged to do that. 
But I have observed, and, and paying more attention to it in recent days, in recent years, I have observed <laughs> at these funeral services that everybody goes to heaven. Have you observed that? I have observed that everybody who dies, according to the preachers who preach these services, that everybody goes to heaven, nobody goes to hell. And, and some of these ones who, who have died, some of the departed loved ones, they, ha they could probably be referred to as departed devils. But yet, the preachers get them into heaven. It doesn't work that way, does it? It doesn't work that way. And so we come to Matthew chapter 7. And here we have in this chapter uh, uh, beginning with verse uh, 13 we have two different entrances, we have two different ways, or two different roads, we have two different trees, we have two professions, and we have two builders. And each of them sending their recipients a different way. In my message I preached this morning, at church, I asked the folks these questions. Do you and I'll ask you the same questions. Do you believe that Jesus is coming again? And, and I had them um, uh, last week because I kind of repeat myself from week to week. You know how we have these introductions that they go on forever and ever and ever sometimes uh, before we get to the message, but. I asked them last week to raise their hands. And so, do you believe that Jesus is coming again? Raise your hands if you believe that. If so, do you believe that he could come today? Raise your hand if you believe that. And now it gets a little tricky. Because I have learned this. It's never safe to assume that everyone in the church audience is a saved, born again, on their way to heaven Christian. Never safe to assume that. Now I am assuming that most of you here tonight have made professions of faith and have trusted in Jesus Christ as your own Savior and Lord. But let me tell you something. I don't know that for sure. I don't know that for sure. And you don't know that for sure about me. Because I don't know your hearts. You don't know my heart. But you know your heart, and God knows your heart. And so this next question, if you believe that Jesus is coming again, and if so, do you believe that he could come today? And if so, are you prepared to meet him today? I'm not going to ask for raising the hands on that question because uh, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. But you can raise your hand yourself in your heart and say, yes, I'm, I'm ready for that. I'm prepared for that. And the only way that you could pre be prepared for that is by trusting that Jesus Christ and him alone is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father, no man cometh unto Father's house, which is in heaven, but through Jesus Christ. And so that's the only way you could say, yes, I'm prepared to meet him tonight if he comes. Or I'm prepared to meet him tonight if I die. If I die.
And if you're not prepared to meet him, if you don't believe that Jesus is coming again, and if you don't believe that he could come today, and if you are not prepared to meet him again, so are you willing to be left behind? Not just for a time, but for all eternity. Think on these things. Because your eternity is at stake. It is written in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 and 20. I call heaven and earth to record or to witness this day against you, against you that I have set before you life and death. Blessing and cursing. Therefore, and you know this verse, I'm sure. Therefore, choose what? Choose life. And who is the life? Huh? Who is the life? Jesus is the life. So choose life. That both thou and thy seed may live that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, and that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to, to, to give them. Now, this verse, it's interesting. <clears throat> Choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God. What is the greatest of the commandments? Jesus told you. What is the greatest of the commandments? To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy might, with all thy strength, with all thy soul, with, with, with all your being. Love the Lord your God with all your being. That's priority, folks. That's priority. To love him. And how do you manifest your love to him? By keeping his commandments. Jesus said that, did he not? To his disciples? If you love me, what did he say? You will keep my commandments. And I was reading something the other day about this. It actually, I, I wasn't looking for this, but it came across in my reading I found it interesting that if you love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your life, with all your strength, with all your soul, with all your being, so on and so forth, if you love the Lord your God that way, if you love the Lord Jesus that way, it won't be a hardship to obey him. It won't be a hardship to obey him. Think about that. It's not like a duty-bound thing. It's not like a burden. Well, he says, I need to do this. So if I love him, I'll do this. Oh, uh, he says not to do this. So if I love him, I shouldn't do this. No, we won't find it a burden whatsoever to do that which the Lord instructs us to do and to be that which we are instructed to be if we love him as we ought. And how are we to love him? Any idea? Any guess? As he first loved us, right? As he first loved us. It is written in 1 John that we love him because he first loved us. We would, we would not love God if he did not first love us. We would not love the Lord Jesus if he did not first love us. We would not even call upon the name of the Lord if he would not first draw us unto himself. And so I, I just found that kind of interesting uh, 
that we don't have to look at this, this matter of keeping his commandments as a burden, as a chore. You know, uh, Albert down here, her mother might say, hey, Albert, how about cleaning up your room? And she'll say, yes, Mama, because I love you, I'll go right away and clean my room. She might say, well, she might not say this out loud, but in her heart she might say, Mama, I don't want to go clean my room. Duty bound. But if you love your mother, she says, Albert, does your mom call you Albert? I don't think so. Does your mom call you Moses? I don't think so. What if mom says, Albert, will you clean your room out of your love for your mother? You'll go clean your room because you love your mother. It's as simple as that. As simple as that. So, so we come down to Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 27. And we find in these verses, verses that are familiar to us all, uh, two, way, uh, two entrances, two ways, two trees, two fruits, two professions, and two builders. And so the scripture reads this way, and I'll just read down through these verses because I want to, want to end with uh, verse uh, 21 and following. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And I maintain that that is hell. That leads to hell. And ultimately, and ultimately to the lake of fire. That's not the entrance way. Or that's not the way. That's not the entrance or the way that you want to go. But anyhow, the Lord says... And many there be which go in thereat. Many there be that go in thereat. And then he goes on and says, because straight is the gate, straight is the door, straight is the entrance way, and st straight is the entrance, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. Once again, who's the life? Jesus. Jesus is eternal life, is he not? Eternal life. We don't, wait, we don't wait until we get to heaven to enjoy eternal life, do we? When God saves us, we enjoy eternal life immediately. And that is because Christ in us, and we in Christ, and so immediately we enjoy eternal life because Christ is in me and I am in Christ. Christ is life. He says it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The life. And so, so it goes on, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And how's verse 14 end? And few there be that find it. I guess this is a true saying that I'm going to say. If not, forgive me, but uh, just based on what the scripture says here, it seems as though hell will be more populated than heaven. That's what it seems like to me. that hell will be more populated than heaven. How many of you have unsaved relatives? You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have unsaved relatives? Husbands or wives? 
mothers or fathers, sisters or brothers, aunts or uncles, so on and so forth. How many of you have good, lost, unsaved friends, unsaved neighbors? And if God, in his mercy and in his grace, doesn't draw them unto himself, doesn't open their hearts unto belief, they will die in their sins and go to hell. Because many there be which go in thereat. And as far as heaven is, consu- is concerned, few there be that find it. I was talking to one of the men after church today. Uh, one of our meetings we had, we had a deacon's meeting after church today. And uh, after the deacon's meeting, I w- we were talking about this. And uh, even at the deacon's meeting, I brought this up. And, uh, and I mentioned that, that that is so sad. That is so sad. But he said to me, but you did your duty and you preached the truth. Well, I might have done my duty and hopefully preached the truth, but it's still sad. It's still sad. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but Inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by your fruits. And do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. And every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, whereby the... Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. And this takes me back to where we began with this morning. Things are are earlier, uh, 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 as I got started here, things are different now. But for so many, things aren't different now. And so that brings us down to verse 31 and following. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in which is in heaven. Uh, What is the will of the Father which is in heaven? Well the will of the Father, which is in heaven, Jesus says, uh, well, uh, I'm trying to find it here. I want to get it right. Uh, well, basically, this is, I can't find it in my notes, so that's fine. Uh, they came up, uh, I, I don't know who it was. I can't remember correctly. It's in my notes. I can't find it, but came up to Jesus and said to Jesus, what, what are the works that we must do, basically, to enter into heaven? And Jesus said, this is the work of God, that you believe on him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this is the work of God. They were interested in what works can we do, as it were, to gain God's favor, to enter into his kingdom? And Jesus said, this is the work of God. The work of God is that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and trust in him and him alone for salvation. That's the work of God in the life of everyone who has come to God by faith, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith, that not yourself, it is the gift of God, not it works, that any, lest any man should, bur- should boast. The work of God is the work of salvation that he begins in the life of every person 
who Jesus Christ has come into this world to seek and to save. It begins with him. That's the work of God. And when God begins that work, it ends in belief unto the salvation of the soul of those that God has drawn unto himself through his Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But now we come to this verse, and we'll conclude these verses, and we'll conclude, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What is the will of my will of uh, uh, of his Father in heaven that you might believe. And many will say unto me this in that day, listen, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in that name, in thy name? Have, <coughs> have uh, and in thy name have, have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. Have we not done this? Have we not done that? Have we not done this? Bring it to, bring it to right here. Have we not walked the aisle? Have we not come to the baptismal pole? Have we not taught Sunday school classes? Have I not been a deacon? Have I not even preached the word? Have I not done this? Have I not done that? That doesn't get anybody saved. It doesn't get one person saved. It's Jesus alone who saves. It's Jesus who saves. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, <coughs> he says and it is written in Matthew, I mean Revelation, and the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him who is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life, uh, the water of life freely. And again, it is written, it is said by the Lord Jesus Christ, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Neither is there any salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that name is the name of Jesus. Come unto Jesus. No one can work their way in heaven. No one can get, their, no one can get preached into heaven. It's only through Christ and him alone. And so, I say this in conclusion, verse 23. Listen to these words. The saddest words that any human being will ever hear. The saddest words that any human being will ever hear. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. I never knew you. I guess... It does matter if you know Christ. But what, what matters more is does he know you? Does he know you? And depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And that's a burden that the Lord has laid on my heart in these recent days, and weeks, and even months. That God's people who think that they are God's people but are not God's people will know for certainty that they are God's people by trusting in Jesus Christ 
and him alone. That things might be different now. That things might be different now. Things are different now. Something happened to me when I gave my heart to Jesus. Things are different now. I was changed. It must be when I gave my heart to Jesus. Things are different now. Uh, that's it. Whoever would like to come and close our, our service. That's all I have for now. That's all I better have for now.